Among all the themes that a modern audience might identify when watching or reading Shakespeare's play Othello, the most obvious might be that this is a play about race. The title character is a black man who marries a white woman and endures race-based insults from nearly everyone in the play, including himself, but most notably and most dramatically from the play's antagonist, Iago. However, you may have also heard that it would be anachronistic to use the word race or racism when discussing this play or Iago's actions because those terms were not used in the same way that we use them today when Shakespeare wrote this play. In fact, the words racism and racist are 20th century words related to the modern idea of white supremacy. So this begs the question, can we use these modern terms to discuss this early modern play, and how might we approach a discussion of race in Shakespeare through texts like Othello, even if the word race is never used within that play? Today I'm going to share with you what I've learned after reading a lot of books and articles about race and Othello, and spoiler alert. It is indeed, among other things, a play about race. It's a play about race and the construction of racial identities at a time in England's history when the modern ideology of race began to take shape. This is the final video in a series of videos about Othello. There's a link to the full playlist in the description below, along with a bibliography for this video. And if this sounds like your kind of thing, I'd recommend checking out the books and articles listed below, and please consider subscribing to be notified when future videos and seasons come out. And with that out of the way, let's dig into race in the early modern period before returning to Othello to see how the play participates in the construction of racial ideologies being formed in Shakespeare's world. To start, we need to define our terms. In this discussion, I'm going to follow a definition of the word race that I found in Noemi Ndiaye's book, Scripts of Blackness, a book that has become indispensable to my understanding of this topic. NDIA says that race is not a form of human difference, but a system of power falsely packaged as a system of knowledge. Race is what happens when, in a given society, the dominant group defines a population group on the basis of an arbitrary criterion and begins seeing that criterion as an embodied essential and hereditary trait that justifies the specific positioning of the target population group in the social order. I find this definition really useful because it bridges the gap between how Shakespeare uses the word race and how we use it today. When Shakespeare uses the word race in his plays, it most often has to do with types of plants or animals. But when he's talking about humans, it refers to bloodlines, social status, or gender. So you might notice that the idea of nobility fits really neatly into that second definition. It's about bloodlines. People who view themselves as being part of the noble race will claim that they have noble blood and use that to justify their position of power within the social order. And these positions, like the concept of nobility or noble blood, are often described as like part of the natural order. Shakespeare will often couple descriptions of race and nobility with references to nature. For example, breeds of horses are viewed as a race, as they are in Macbeth when Duncan's horses are described as beauteous and swift, the minions of their race linking Duncan's noble bloodlines with the nobility of his horses. Or in Henry IV Part II, when Suffolk insults Warwick by saying that his mother must have coupled with somebody less noble to produce him. To do this, he uses a botanical metaphor to say that Warwick is a grafted crab fruit on a more noble tree and never of the Neville's noble race implying that in nature and human society, social class and nobility is, just as NDIA's definition says, an embodied and hereditary trait. In both these examples, we might accurately describe the use of race as defining difference based on a hierarchy of value created by nature. The implication is that there are superior breeds and inferior breeds of horses or fruit trees, just as there are noble families and common families. To be positioned within a human class-based category is to be placed within a power hierarchy that those in power characterize as organic or natural, like it has to be that way. To use the language of our working definition of race, in both these examples, the term race is used by a dominant group, the nobility, to define a part 
of the population on a basis of arbitrary criteria viewed as hereditary and essential. This hereditary and essential criteria is then used to justify both the representation and the treatment of a social group as superior or inferior. Duncan's horses are superior, the crab fruit is inferior. So when somebody tells you that it's anachronistic to use the word race solely as we use it today in relationship to this text, they will willfully ignore some important context. The way Shakespeare used race is very similar to the way we use race today because both are used to explain and justify positions in a social hierarchy based on arbitrary criteria. They also notably leave out England's participation in colonialism and slavery during this time and how narratives promoting barbarism and savagery in Africa and the Americas justified the representation and treatment of people based on skin color. A play like Othello shows us the process by which the term race began to incorporate skin color into other intersecting and equally arbitrary criteria used to create power hierarchies in human communities like nobility. Shakespeare may not have used the word race in exactly the same way that we do, but his usage does refer to an ideology of natural hierarchies, and that's the same thing that's used to justify the violence of chattel slavery during this time period. What we often see in Shakespeare's plays is that hereditary criteria can be used to justify the oppression or perceived inferiority of nearly anyone, but most commonly when his plays deal with class or social status. However, the idea that people are born inferior, of hereditary inferiority, is not limited to social status and nobility. Gender, religion, nation, and geography are also positioned as racial categories in the early modern period. This is why scholars such as NDIA argue that we should think of racial ideology as a matrix of intersecting and overlapping assumptions about human differences. In early modern England, for example, skin color became grouped with a series of other markers like class, gender, religion, and nationality within the use of race as a social category. We can look specifically at Othello's identity as a more to better understand how this term might include overlapping and intersecting associations. The word more on the early modern English stage is a capacious term. It can mean a lot of things. According to Ian Smith, the term encompasses three broad categories, geographic, religious, and blackness. The term could be used to describe somebody from North Africa, it could be used to describe a Muslim, and or it could be used to describe somebody with dark skin. All of these categories can and have been used to position an individual within a system of power by a dominant group. So similar to how the nobility claims privilege over the commoner, men claim privilege over women, Europeans claim privilege over North Africans, Christians claim privilege over Muslims, and white people began to enslave black people during this time based on skin color. Consequently, all of these categories associated with being a more are not simply descriptions of difference, they are positions inside a social order. They justify social relations of power by marking those privileged categories as though they are the products of nature, like breeds of horses or fruits from a tree. And it's easy to find examples of how this particular matrix operates in the play Othello. Othello is a Moor, but does not carry all the assumed significations of that term. Moors are coded as Muslim, for example, but Othello is Christian. By having Othello fit some of the associations of the term, but not others, the play calls attention to how a converted Moor is coded as superior to an unconverted Moor. Othello is also a Moor who fights on behalf of Venice rather than on behalf of Venice's enemies. Additionally, his presence calls attention to the cultural logic of Venice that would privilege a lighter-skinned white moor over a darker-skinned black moor, or a North African prince above a North African servant. These categories of geography, nationality, religious affiliation, and colorism overlap and the intersections contribute to an individual's assumed position within social relationships. Othello's presence in this play therefore disrupts a simple understanding of these categories by demonstrating how one man cannot easily be placed within a given category. His position as a Moor contains multitudes that include the color of his skin, but not only the color of his skin. And in contrast to Othello's blackness, Desdemona in the play is often described as fair. This description has a double meaning, as we can understand that word to literally mean beautiful, but it's also a signifier for white. 
fair can refer to her pale skin. This is because beauty standards are culturally constructed and change over time and from place to place. In early modern England, pale skin was seen as beautiful, so the term fair has those intersecting associations, beautiful and also white. Additionally, beauty standards in any time period often have a relationship to assumptions about class. To have pale skin in early modern England implies that the woman does not need to work out in the field, that she's of an upper class. Having a toned stomach and arms were also not important to early modern English beauty standards. People working in the field could, and often did, have athletic bodies toned by long hours of work. Today, we might say that the opposite is true. Having a tan and a six-pack means that you have the ability to leave the office and go on vacation, to relax outside or afford a gym membership. The nature of work changed, and with it, our perception of beauty changed. So in early modern England, the word fair is used to draw attention to Desdemona's beauty, whiteness, and the assumption of family wealth. But that's not the end of the word fair's associations with colorism. Beauty is often linked with morality as well. If somebody looks good, there is an unconscious belief that they are good, and this belief further entrenches biases against people outside the dominant group. To hopefully make this point even more clear, Shakespeare scholar Kim F. Hall has noted that frequently black in Renaissance discourse is opposed not to white, but to beauty or fairness, and these terms most often refer to the appearance or moral states of women. So the category of color intersects with class and the perception of feminine virtue as well. This is all to say that early modern England linked beauty to whiteness, and whiteness has a relationship to socioeconomic class and to virtue. And the matrix doesn't end there. Whiteness also has symbolic and linguistic links to purity, something that is unmarked or unstained. It is popular to say something like stained by sin, evoking the image of a white sheet marked by something dark. The result is a popular naturalizing metaphor where colorism is tied to the idea of a sinful action in an otherwise pure life. And Othello himself even uses this metaphor in Act 3 when he says that Desdemona's name that was as fresh as Diane's visage is now begrimed and black as mine own face. Virtuous reputations are linguistically, by default, white, and any stain upon them, metaphorically and linguistically, coded as black. So religious purity and virtue also enter the mix of class and skin color, especially for women. This metaphor of white purity was important to early performances of medieval morality plays that long predate Shakespeare. Medieval morality plays were short plays with a religious message about overcoming temptation and sin. In those plays, a devil would tempt an everyman character, and the actor playing the devil, or sin, would often be dressed in black with his skin painted black. This costuming was a simple way for these productions to signify the distinction between angels and devils, between good and evil. Noemi and D.I.A. calls the resulting theatrical convention a diabolical script of blackness. It's an assumption about what blackness means on the English stage before any context is given. It's the always already present expectation. It's the script that an audience already has in its head that a black character is sinful before the audience sees a black character enter the stage. In other words, we should recognize that the London audience for Shakespeare's plays already had a visual vocabulary and presumption when seeing a character dressed and painted in black. The repeated performance of blackness in these morality plays as signifying moral corruption, both visually and linguistically, spills over into the language of secular theater, significantly in productions that include a character with dark skin. So, according to all this historical and cultural logic I just described, to be black on the early modern English stage is to be incorporated into the negative criteria associated with the idea of race, to be low class, ugly, sinful, corrupt, deviant, and so on. Real and metaphorical blackness fits into the matrix of racial classifications as another way for the white, wealthy, dominant group to justify oppression and violence. Judith Butler famously introduced an influential philosophy of gender based on the idea that nearly all group identities are formed and reformed through continual performance of particular traits. 
Like, to be a man or a woman means to be consistently and continuously performing the traits associated with being a man or a woman. And the early modern stage is a public space for the creation and constant recreation of identity performance, not just gender performance, but also the performance of racial categories. Those associations and expectations about class, beauty, and sin were performed and further entrenched on the English stage. And okay, so now, with a better understanding of the varied meanings of the term more and the appearance of a black character, we can begin to see how the character Othello might be viewed on the English stage in 1603. Othello begins with Iago, using the full force of all the underlying cultural assumptions about Moors. At the start of the play, we don't know who Iago and Othello are, and thus it's easy for Iago to influence our perception of Othello before we even meet Othello. Iago doesn't even use Othello's name. He only refers to him by his group identity, a Moor, to make sure that Shakespeare's presumably white audience applies all the biased expectations associated with that term. So amazingly, Iago is telling us how to read Othello's blackness before we see Othello. If we believe Iago, Othello is an incompetent leader who has promoted the wrong man, and he's a thief who has stolen a rich man's daughter. Iago says that an old black ram is tupping Brabantio's white hue, which implies that Othello is ugly. He advises Brabantio to awake the snorting citizens with the bell, or else the devil will make a grandsire of you, which implies that Othello is associated with the devil and therefore evil. So Iago is, like, really playing all the hits here. In just a few lines, he's implied that Othello is sinful by calling him a thief, that he's ugly by calling him an old black ram, and calls him the devil by, you know, like, calling him the devil. Iago is using all of those symbolic and linguistic associations of blackness and pinning them on a human being whose name the audience hasn't even learned. Like, before we even meet Othello, we are being given an interpretive framework for how to view Othello. Iago makes sure of that. But the moment that Othello appears on stage, literally all of those accusations fall apart. He has all the trappings of the upper class. He's noble and well-spoken. He speaks of love rather than sexual conquest that he was accused of in the first scene. And on top of that, he's Christian. When confronted by Brabantio and Rodrigo with drawn swords, he tells them to keep up your bright swords for the dew will rust them, which mimics an order that Jesus gave Peter in the book of John as he attacked a high priest servant. Put up thy sword into the sheath. So Othello links himself to Jesus rather than the devil, making him quite different than the character Iago led us to believe we would encounter. Shakespeare seemingly wants his audience to use their pre-existing associations and biases for what it means to be black on the early modern English stage, but then he subverts those expectations. The reality of the character of Othello undermines all of them. Despite Iago's best efforts, he's not going to be able to successfully pin those associations on Othello. The reality of Othello's character resists those significations that the audience is led to expect following the way that Iago initially characterized him. In the play, the Duke ultimately calls attention to the insufficiencies of Iago's linguistic connections between light and dark, the way that he tries to link whiteness to purity and blackness to sin. The Duke tells Probantio, if virtue no delighted beauty lack, your son-in-law is far more fair than black. That is, Iago's linguistic associations don't make sense when we're dealing with individual people. Othello's embodied blackness does not have any relationship to the allegorical blackness of morality plays according to what the Duke says. And like, well said, Duke. So, failing to take down Othello with the use of the medieval morality play's diabolical script of blackness, Iago then attempts to use a diabolical script of feminine whiteness against Desdemona. The term most often used to describe Desdemona is fair, and Iago will use that term against her by convincing Othello that she is a white devil, one whose fairness or whiteness is only cosmetic and hides a metaphorically black soul. If Othello's dark skin doesn't mean that his soul is automatically dark, as the Duke says, then the reverse is also true. Having white skin is no guarantee of a white soul. It's possible that whiteness might cover up a much darker soul, something that Iago knows well because, <laughs> I mean, that describes him. In Act 2, Iago says that when devils will the blackest sins put on, they do suggest at first with heavenly shows as I do now. 
He will turn Desdemona's virtue into pitch, and out of her own goodness make the net that shall enmesh them all. In short, he will undermine Desdemona's virtuous reputation by claiming that her goodness masks something malicious, that her fairness, her whiteness, is simply surface. We should note here that on the early modern stage, Desdemona would have been played by a boy, a boy in whiteface, in makeup, and makeup in the early modern period would be coded as deceitful and unnatural. In fact, the only other character called fair in this entire play is Bianca, a sex worker who presumably wears makeup and whose name literally means white. Again, this is all calling attention to the insufficiency of these linguistic intersections between whiteness and feminine virtue to accurately explain the world. In Act 2, Scene 1, the scene on the docks, Iago shows Desdemona and the audience that he's capable of using multiple interpretive frameworks to undermine any category of person. Iago is a white male Christian Venetian. He inhabits the ultimate position of insider within this play. From that position, he's able to spin anybody outside of those privileged categories as deceitful, unworthy, or inferior. He represents the dominant group and can arbitrarily define criterion to establish a social order. And he can do this in such a way that it authorizes violence against anybody below him in that social order. Brabantio and Rodrigo do not hesitate to draw their swords on Othello, and Othello, once he accepts Iago's interpretation of Desdemona, feels totally comfortable hitting her in public and ultimately killing her. Noemi Ndiaye summarizes this better than I can when she writes that if the diabolical script of face painting, applied to both black men and white women, manifests the presence of a unified white male gaze behind Iago, its indifferent treatment of the black and white antithesis suggests that major inconsistencies might be at work within that gaze. There, I believe, lies the play's potential critique of the white male gaze. The critique is that Iago uses the prejudices and expectations his audience may have in order to influence the perception of certain types of bodies as they appear on stage. Iago assumes that his audience will be susceptible to his dominant perspective, the perspective of the white male Christian. He shows the audience how the visual vocabularies and linguistic habits that already exist might be used to influence our perception of the black and female bodies that appear on the stage. He then uses those assumptions in order to do those black and female bodies unambiguous harm. He uses the biases that his audience might have against black men and against white women, women who might fear that their skin isn't white enough to meet the preferences of that dominant white male gaze, and he justifies violence with it. Iago transparently manipulates these biases and is unambiguously the villain of this play. He's the cause of Othello's tragedy. And interestingly, he makes us, the audience, complicit the entire time. We, reading this play or standing in his audience, are his accomplices. He stops to speak with us in confidence throughout the play. We begin the play by believing his interpretation of Othello until Othello comes in to prove us wrong. Iago confides in us as he manipulates Othello's interpretation of Desdemona's body. We watch him, and not only do we not turn away, we're mesmerized by Iago's language and his actions. This is what makes Othello's final speech all the more important. He tells us, his presumed white audience, to speak of me as I am. Nothing extenuates, nor set down aught in malice. He tells us to avoid any of those linguistic or symbolic interpretive frameworks that pre-exist him and treat him as the human being that he is. In this moment, the play asks us to do better than he did. And this message was performed on stage at the exact moment in history when a white population began looking for ways to justify the transatlantic slave trade. Those in power used the same interpretive frameworks that Shakespeare uses in this play. The logic of the play assumes the position of blackness can fit within older religious and class-based racial ideologies and argued some people deserved subordinate positions within a power structure due to some arbitrary hereditary feature. And the character of Othello pleads with us to avoid these pitfalls, to avoid these diabolical scripts of blackness and white femininity. And he makes this plea as he struggles with his own intersecting identities and associations as a Christian Moor from North Africa, working in service to the Venetian state. Othello, and other Shakespeare plays, show us the mechanisms by which the term race came to include skin color to justify slavery and white supremacist ideology. 
So for those who've wondered if modern readers and audiences make anachronistic assumptions about Othello and race, perhaps this video has demonstrated that the idea of race, including colorism, is very much what Othello is about. And that's all for this season of Shakespeare Play by Play. Subscribe to be notified when future seasons come out. My next one is on The Tempest and I've already begun work on it. Thank you for watching.